In the post-pandemic world, the global economic order and industrial ecosystem have changed drastically. South Korea's big three industries, which are hydrogen electric vehicles, chips, and biotech, have shown resilience and competitiveness in the rapidly evolving global market. South Korea has the largest share of the hydrogen vehicle market, which is a key sector in Korea's Green New Deal. Despite the global economic turndown, South Korean semiconductor firms posted the largest revenues and powered a recovery in exports. The biotech industry, which is a higher value-added business, has seen solid growth potential and laid the groundwork for South Korea to become a global vaccine hub. South Korea's big three industries are attracting attention from overseas. Now, we'll focus on the factors that are making it attractive to invest in South Korean industries. The worldwide resurgence of COVID-19 infections associated with the Delta variant suggests that the global pandemic may stretch into 2022, raising concerns that risks to the economic outlook will remain high through the end of this year and early next year. But the disruptive changes brought on by the pandemic have also opened new windows of opportunity to achieve innovative growth. Emerging stronger from the coronavirus pandemic in the next normal. I'm Kun Young Jennifer Moon, and this is Invest Korea Week 2021. I want to welcome our viewers from all around the world to Korea's largest investment promotion event alongside Sean Cheng, Commissioner of the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency's Foreign Investment Promotion Division, Invest Korea, the official organizer of IKW 2021. Hello, I'm Sean Cheng of Invest Korea. Invest Korea Week marks its 17th this year, and we'd like to thank those who supported us last year despite the fact that we had to hold IKW 2020 online due to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we're back again this year under the slogan of investing in innovative and sustainable Korea. We are indeed. Our first online IKW last year brought in more than 1 million views and helped attract significant investments. In fact, IKW is in and of itself a reflection of how changes brought on by the pandemic are turning crisis into growth opportunities. Right, we have a variety of events prepared for IKW 2021, which starts from November 3rd to November 5th. Of course, outreach is another key element of IKW, and we wish to see all those in the business realm, both local and foreign, the academia and the government build relations, and take this opportunity to connect with our viewers as well. This forum is about discussing innovative growth and new possibilities instead of mourning our losses from COVID-19. IKW 2021 aims to share information on the latest and post-pandemic business opportunities that you can enjoy by partnering with South Korea. The latest trends in global investment and where South Korea stands as a promising investment destination in this post-pandemic era. Let's take a pulse. But before that, here's the President of the Republic of Korea. Sege 국민과 기업의 의지가 모여 디지털과 친환경 산업이 빠르게 성장하고 있습니다. 한국의 갈 풍경과 기업하기 좋은 환경을 직접 보여드리지 못해 아쉽지만 글로벌 기업인들과 습각들께 한국의 유망 산업과 투자 환경 정책을 소개할 수 있어 매우 뜻깊습니다. 
많은 분들의 노력으로 외국인 투자 주관 포럼이 17회를 이어오고 있습니다. 포럼을 준비한 코트라 IK의 노고가 많았습니다. 축전을 보내주신 ARM 홀딩스의 사이먼 시거스 최고 경영자님, 머크 그룹의 벨렌 가리호 최고 경영자님과 세계 투자 진흥 기관 연합 파드 알 개가의 회장님께도 깊이 감사드립니다. 이번 포럼을 통해 새로운 투자 기회를 찾고 한국과 함께 성장 발전해 나가는 소중한 계기가 되길 바랍니다. 세계 기업인과 투자자 여러분, 저는 올해 1월 다보스 포럼과 두 차례 방미 계기에 한국 투자에 대한 세계 기업인들의 뜨거운 관심을 확인할 수 있었습니다. 한국은 유망하고 지속가능하며 안정적인 투자처입니다. 감염병, 재난재해 같은 위기에 대응 능력이 뛰어나고 경제 회복력도 우수합니다. 락다운 없이 코로나 확산을 우수하게 통제했고 기업들은 코로나 상황에서도 정상적인 경제활동을 이어나갔습니다. 그 결과 한국 경제는 가장 빠르게 회복하고 있습니다. 올해 주요국 성장 전망치가 대부분 하향 조정되는 상황에서도 4.3%의 높은 전망치를 유지하고 있습니다. 국가 신용 등급 또한 최고 수준을 유지 중이며 세계은행의 기업 환경 평가에서도 7년 연속 5위권을 지키고 있습니다. 지식 재산권도 활발하여 블룸버그 혁신지수 세계 1위, 세계 지식재산기구 글로벌 혁신지수 아시아 1위의 혁신 강국으로 발돋움하였으며 신기술, 신제품을 사업화하기에 좋은 최적의 테스트 배드입니다. 한국은 지금 그린 뉴딜과 디지털 뉴딜을 중심으로 대형 국가 프로젝트인 한국판 뉴딜 2.0을 추진 중입니다. 이미 세계의 많은 기업과 투자자들이 코로나의 어려운 상황 속에서도 K뉴딜, 소부장, 바이오 분야 투자를 비롯해 역대 2위의 투자를 하고 있습니다. 여러분이 한국의 변화와 도전에 함께해 주시길 바랍니다. 세계 기업인과 투자자 여러분, 한국 정부는 국경을 초월해 여러분과 함께할 것입니다. 외국인 투자 기업에 대한 세제, 입지, 현금, 고용 지원을 확대하고 있습니다. 새로운 사업의 원활한 진행을 위해 규제를 완화하고 투자의 어려움도 적극 해소할 것입니다. 특히 반도체, 미래차, 바이온드, 빅3 첨단 산업에서 연구 개발과 시설 투자 지원을 강화하겠습니다. 소부장, 탄소 중립 분야의 핵심 기술 개발을 통해 새로운 투자 기회를 창출하겠습니다. 무역 투자 플랫폼도 더욱 튼튼히 구축할 것입니다. 한국은 미, 중, EU 등 거대 경제권을 포함한 세계 57개국과 FTA 네트워크를 갖고 있습니다. RCEP 비준을 앞두고 있고 CPTPP 가입을 검토하고 있으며 한신가폴 DPA가 타결되면 한국을 거점으로 기업들이 폭넓게 세계 시장에 진출할 수 있을 것입니다. 투자는 새로운 성장과 발전의 마중물입니다. 포스트 코로나 시대를 열어갈 새롭고 다양한 기회가 한국에 있습니다. 한국에 투자하십시오. 오늘 여러분과 한국의 투자 파트너십이 강화되어 새 시대를 함께 열어갈 수 있기를 기대합니다. 감사합니다. Hello, this is j o n g y e l Yu, President and CEO of Cotra. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to Invest Korea Week 2021. I would especially like to express my deepest gratitude to President Moon Jae-in and the CEOs of global companies for sending your congratulatory messages for this event. The COVID-19 pandemic had a huge impact on foreign direct investment around the world. In 2020, global FDI decreased by one-third 
from the previous year, and it is still making it difficult to conduct global business due to travel restrictions and disease control measures of each country. However, I believe that it is important to provide more opportunities to work together and build stronger global partnerships to overcome this difficult time we are all suffering together. Therefore, we are hosting our 17th Invest Korea Week to share insight on Korea's business environments and to help investors to find ideal Korean partners to strengthen their business cooperation in various industries. As a global hub for high-tech industries, Korea has established optimal conditions for various industries to develop at an even pace. Korea has the world's best companies in emerging industries, such as semiconductor, biopharma, smart mobility, hydrogen fuel cell, and secondary battery. Korea also has an excellent industrial infrastructure and high digital competitiveness. In addition, as a value chain cluster, Korea has developed a robust industrial ecosystem comprised of a tightly integrated supply chain for design, manufacturing, materials, parts, and equipment. The country has also created high-tech industrial clusters for the collaboration of both Korean and foreign suppliers and buyers. This year's Invest to Korea Week aims to support global companies discover partnership opportunities with the world's best companies in Korea and to help companies run their businesses in a safer, more stable environment than anywhere else in the world based on the country's seamless supply chain. Furthermore, at IKW this year, we will provide new innovative growth opportunities through various forums and conferences and introduce Korea's charm as the perfect investment destination for high-tech industries. COTRA was recently awarded the Investment Promotion Award by the United Nations. The award was given to recognize the country's effort in promoting investment in the healthcare sector to overcome the COVID-19 crisis and promote good health. We will continue to put in our utmost efforts to ensure your success in Korea. I hope Invest Korea Week 2021 will be the first step towards that success. Once again, I welcome you to IKW and would like to thank all the participants in this event. I wish you all good health and happiness. Thank you. Hello and welcome. I'm honored to have the opportunity to provide this congratulatory message for Invest Korea Week. A special thank you to the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy for hosting this event. The COVID-19 pandemic has unfortunately required my presence to be virtual this year. However, I would like to acknowledge how well Korea has done in managing this crisis at the same time as accelerating its industrial growth. Bold and innovative plans and policies like the Korean New Deal are great examples of how forward-looking Korea's approach is to the global economy and its role in the world. This includes the acknowledgement of the inherent connection between our digital future and our need to protect the environment for generations to come. In that same vein, Korea is already a global leader in the semiconductor industry and the significant investment made by the government to develop the K Semiconductor Belt at a critical moment for the industry will further grow local and global economic opportunities as the world demands billions of semiconductors in the coming years. This expansion in semiconductor capacity is critical to unlocking the true potential of arms partners globally to drive innovation in the future. Through our decades of partnership, we at ARM have witnessed countless breakthroughs by your world-leading companies. We look forward to great continued collaboration with longtime partners of ARM, as well as new partnerships within the thriving startup community in Korea. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of this event, and I look forward to visiting in person once again soon. Thank you. 
President Moon Jae-in, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Belen Garijo. I am the chair of the executive board and the CEO of Merck. Merck is a global market leader and an innovative company across electronics, life science and healthcare. On behalf of everyone at Merck, I deeply appreciate this opportunity to wish you a very successful start to invest Korea Week 2021. In particular, I would like to applaud COTRA for the innovation-powered investment strategy of which Merck is a proud champion. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate President Moon Jae-in and his government on their rapid response to the global pandemic. Your strength and your resilience have helped make Korea a model in containing COVID-19 and your plans to help narrow the vaccination gap in low-income countries should be an inspiration to the world. Merck has been an active partner in Korea for more than 35 years. We have invested more than 100 million euros in Korea over the time. And today we employ more than 1,300 people across 11 sites. I'm very pleased to tell you that our commitment to Korea will greatly increase moving forward. As we strengthen our collaboration across key growth industries, Korea is now our second largest country in the world for investment in electronics. And over the next five years, our electronic business will invest around 600 million euro in Korea while continuously investing in local R&D. Over the last decade, Korea has also powered its way to the forefront of the global biotech industry. And once again, Merck has been there since the start, supporting the scale up of your local bioprocessing capabilities. Finally, it is insightful that the Bloomberg Innovation Index last year ranked Germany as the world's most innovative economy, with Korea being number two. But this year, Germany is in the fourth place, while Korea is number one. Congratulations. Your investment strategy is clearly working. Merck will continue to be a proud champion and strong investor in Korea. Along the way, I do expect that we will continue to learn very much from you. Thank you very much. Dear Excellencies and colleagues, greetings from Dubai. On behalf of WIPA members, I have the pleasure to congratulate my colleagues in Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency, Kotra, for the 17th Invest Korea Week. I'm confident that you all will greatly benefit from the program of this edition of Invest Korea Week, which is rich in data, analysis, and recommendation that will help shape the future investment plans towards a more sustainable and prosperous future. I wish you all a successful Invest Korea Week Thank you. The World Intellectual Property Organization's Global Innovation Index takes the pulse of the most recent global innovation trends and ranks the innovation ecosystem performance of roughly 130 economies each year, focusing on a long list of criteria. Well, the 2021 index found that innovating is still blossoming in some sectors despite the global economic slowdown and coronavirus pandemic, especially in industries to do with public health and the environment. While Switzerland topped the rankings for the 11th time, Sweden second and the U.S. rounding off the top three, one of the biggest winners of the rankings was South Korea, which left five places to fifth in 2021. Yeah. <laughs>
This year's Global Innovation Index reveals, in spite of the massive impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on lives and livelihoods, many sectors have shown remarkable resilience, especially those that have embraced digitalization, technology, and innovation. North America and Europe continue to host some of the world's leading innovators, but What's for sure is that the pandemic has accelerated the long-term geographical shift of innovation activities towards Asia and rising to the occasion, South Korea. So how so, and is it sustainable? We'll find out in part one of IKW 2021. And we begin by seeking some perspective. He's a leading scholar in the field of transportation geography, best known for his model of economic bubbles that follow a relatively consistent pattern separated into four phases. Jean-Paul Rodrigue, professor at Hofstra University in New York. Greetings. Hello, Professor Rodrigue. It's great to have you on the program. It's a pleasure to be there. Nearly two years into the pandemic, economists, scholars, and business executives agree that the global economy is on track towards a recovery. In fact, throughout 2021, their views have, on average, been consistently positive. Yet with the Delta variant affecting so many parts of the world, the worries of the pandemic's effects on the economy have resurfaced. How has 23 months of the pandemic impacted the global economy? I mean, where is it headed going forward? That's a, a very complicated question to answer because across the board, there is a lot of confusion. And that's what this pandemic has brought on is a little bit of, uh, I would say, uncertainty and testing the resilience of global supply chains. And those are the most resilient, the most innovative, and I would say uh, the most... Um, proactive uh, tend to fare, to fare better. But still, there is a lot of uncertainties because what we have noticed, first of all, is a gigantic diver divergence between the transportation of passengers and freight. For instance, the global airline industry in 2020 saw a 65% drop of its traffic, while the global level of, of air freight activity saw a drop of 0.5%. So it tells you that anything that involves people or social interaction is going down, and anything that involves a distribution and movement of freight and commodities seems to be doing much better. Well, FDI is an integral part of an open and effective international ecosystem, uh, economic system, and a major catalyst for development as it plays a crucial role in the development of both emerging and mature economies. Uh, the UN Conference on Trade and Development says it expects 2021 to be a fallow year for FDI with any recovery not expected to start until 2022. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, because I would say many large investors are currently reassessing their strategy. Uh, as you may be aware, there's a lot of, uh, we could say, pulling out of China these days. Uh, American firms, Korean firms as well, Japanese firms are reassessing their role in China. And that, that reshoring may benefit, I would say, the home countries, including Korea. So that's one uh, uncertainty concerning investment. So there might be less of it but it could be a little bit more concentrated in the places that appears the most promising and effective. And it looks like, and the, the data underlines that, that Korea is such a location. Well, the pandemic has also gotten the world to rethink, of course, global value chain. In the post-pandemic era, how do we increase the stability and resilience of GVCs without losing efficiency gains? I mean, is it perfectly diversifying GVCs across many suppliers or reshoring part of the production domestically? I think the very big driver of these reassessment is going to be what's happening in maritime shipping. As you may be very well aware, uh, we have a lot of congestion along the world's major gateways, uh, particularly in, in, in Europe and North America. Also, of course, a lot of Asia as well. And this, this decline in velocity of global value chain, again, push towards getting closer to your markets. Uh, again, which means a little bit getting out of China. 
And there's a lot of talk in America as well that we may have overextended ourselves and the pandemic is underlining this, I would say, this weakness. The current reassessment is underlining the weaknesses of global value chain that have been too overextended. And therefore, they need to be a little bit shorter. We need to be a little bit closer to home and we need to, I would say, lower the response time. And that seems to be a pretty powerful trend. Um, last year, at the height of the pandemic, you even went on to say that you predict South Korea would become a leading hub for global high-tech manufacturing from here on out. Do you still stand by that prediction? I mean, what's your forecast for this economy in the post-COVID era? I, I think it's still correct. Uh, again, my assumption is the demand for the goods produced by the Korean economy uh, is going to endure. As you may be aware, for instance, there is... a uh, problems in the manufacturing of cars uh, around the world, which is due to, uh, in particular, to uh, integrated circuit shortage. Actually, Korea makes car and makes IC at the same time. So it's an example that Korea has some kind of an advantage over key supply chain because it's the provider of those strategic goods and it can latch itself up to this, I would say, this clustering of manufacturing and remain resilient in, while others are becoming, I would say, a little bit more weaker or a little bit more shaky, if the term is correct. Now, for uh, the fifth straight year, Korea attracted more than 20 billion US dollars in FDI, even during this time of COVID. In fact, FDI uh, pledges to South Korea shot up more than 70% the first half of 2021. What are some key factors that make this country an attractive FDI destination at this point in time? Yeah, I must say this is impressive. That's um, quite, quite an achievement, to say the least, in, in light of the current context. And I would say my best guess, and that's a guess, uh, it's the strength of the Korean manufacturing clusters in key sectors, such as shipbuilding, such as automotive, such as electronics, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, also uh, chemicals. All of these, I would say, clusters that were built in Korea for the last 30, 40 years or so have created a, a form of, of synergy and a form of strength, which seems to be enduring and it seems to be attracting investments because, because of that, because you know that Korea is a, a reliable a trade partner, Korea is a fairly open country, and Korea is a country that you can trust compared with other countries, which are, could be a little bit more, I would say, or a little bit less reliable, and we won't name anybody in particular here. Well, so um, what's your forecast of the global economy and South Korea in terms of the reshaping landscape of the GVC in the next five to ten years? Um, my expectation is that the rate of innovation is, will continue. We're going to see the emergence of very impressive new goods and services. Uh, Korea is going to be among the leaders uh, in, in the world regarding this, probably around the top five, but it's going to, it's going to remain as such. But unfortunately, at the same time, I, I think the next four to five years or so are going to be also difficult times for the global economy. We're going to be facing recession. We're going to be facing inflation. We might also have a very difficult energy transition taking place. Uh, we are already observing that in China. Uh, you're quite aware of the situation where you have a lot of significant power outage. We also have having spike in energy prices in Europe, less so in North America, and that creates a lot of uncertainty. So whoever manufacture innovation, manufacture energy supply systems, and provide an excellent connectivity to the rest of the world is going to be, I would say, in a good position to, to evolve with, with the, within these very uncertain times. All right. Well, uh, Jean-Paul Rodrigue, professor at Hofstra University, many thanks for your insights and expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you. As pointed out by Jean-Paul Rodrigue, the pressures of the pandemic have pushed up innovation investment. The ICT, pharmaceutical and biotech industries have led this investment growth with, of course, the speedy development of COVID-19 vaccines highlighting the power of investment at the cutting edge of innovation technology. Fast-moving innovation has been the name of the game in several Korean health industries, including pharma, for a number of years. And now, the country's drug industry is continuing a period of high growth while working to prop up one of the biggest pharma biotech hubs 
in the world. As South Korea emerges as a global hub for vaccine production, investments from firms and countries around the world flow into the nation. Global Bio Long South Korea has invested in the production of vaccine raw materials as well as winning contracts for vaccine production. Why did global firms choose South Korea to invest in? South Korea's effective containment measures change the way the world perceives Korea. Large biopharma facilities, top-notch know-how, and technical expertise makes it an attractive base for global production. And the South Korean government pledged a total of $1.9 billion over five years, as outlined in the K-Global Vaccine Hub strategy. Let's talk about the potential of South Korea, which is emerging as a hub for vaccine production, as it prepares to take center stage in the world's biopharma industry. There have been clear winners and losers from the pandemic. While hospitality, tourism, and energy sectors came to partial or complete standstills, IT, digital technology, and pharmaceuticals, for example, have seen their activities boom. With it, South Korea is growing rapidly in the biopharma manufacturing market on its way to become a global hub for vaccine production in the contract manufacturing market. Cytiva, a Massachusetts-based research and biopharma manufacturing specialist, is shelling out $52.5 million to build a plant in South Korea to make disposable cell culture bags used in vaccine production. Moderna has already inked an agreement with a South Korean firm to serve as a finish and fill partner for its international vaccine production and is also adding an mRNA vaccine production line that's expected to be finished in the first half of next year. So why the sudden focus on South Korea? We'll talk about it with Robert Langer, a scientist and professor at MIT and a founder of the Massachusetts-based biotech firm Moderna. Not only that, Professor Langer is also a serial entrepreneur with over 4,500 patents and pending. Professor Langer, it's good to have you on the program. Now, less than two years ago, little was known about the mysterious virus that was sickening dozens in this part of the world and spreading rapidly unbeknownst to people across the globe. And neither was Moderna, which was a small, then relatively unknown biotech company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm sure little did they know that they would soon be thrust into the global spotlight when Moderna became the first American company to jump into the race to a coronavirus vaccine. As one of the founders of Moderna, what would you attribute the overnight success of Moderna to? Well, there are a number of things that I think were responsible for Moderna's success. First uh, is the technology, and messenger RNA technology is a, is a great way to make uh, proteins or vaccines very, very quickly. Uh, and, and secondly, Moderna also had created very good delivery systems, which are certain types of nanoparticles that you could put the messenger RNA in. And that was absolutely critical, because if you didn't have that, then the body would destroy uh, the messenger RNA. But when you put the messenger RNA in to the nanoparticles and you inject it into the body, the body acts as a factory in a way. It actually makes uh, proteins or makes a vaccine. Uh, so you can do it very quickly. And so Moderna uh, had actually started, we started the company in 2010. And what happened then is we, we were fortunate, we hired some wonderful people I mean, the, the co-chair of the, the, or the chair of the board of the company was Nubar Fayan, who was one of the founders uh, of the company, and he's part of flagship pioneering. Uh, he actually heads it. Uh, we, we also hired um, some terrific, uh, a terrific CEO, Stefan Bonsell, terrific president, Stephen Ho. So we had, and just lots of great scientists from MIT and Harvard and other places. So we had a great team. 
Well, you know, uh, Professor Langer, it usually takes at least a decade to develop a new vaccine, and Moderna is a firm that's barely 10 years old itself. How did you come about founding this revolutionary biotech company? Yeah, well, what happened was there was another, a scientist at Harvard, Derek Rossi, he'd made a discovery that if he could take certain types of messenger RNA and put them in cells and, and actually make a, a regular cell into what's called like an iPS cell or stem cell, stem like cell. And um, so he came to see me because uh, he was interested in, in, in moving this further. And, and, he, and he and I talked about this and uh, we then got Ken Chen involved, who's a cardiologist and then new, and also Nubar Fayan, who I mentioned before, who, who ran flagship uh, uh, pioneering. So the four of us together started it. But to me, it just seemed like I had been an advisor to Genentech since the 70s, which specialized in creating protein therapeutics. And, and they were, uh, in their day, uh, you know, really revolutionary. But proteins, like you said, that, that takes a while to make, even though they can create all kinds of new therapies. The beauty of messenger RNA is there's, this, there's a central dogma, DNA makes RNA makes proteins. So if you could take the RNA and inject it into the body, you would just make whatever, you could make whatever protein you want. And then if we had the right nanoparticles, we could deliver it into the cells to treat intracellular diseases, or we could treat uh, cell surface diseases, pretty much anything. So it just seemed to me, uh, and I'm sure the others, that, that this was something that really could be totally revolutionary. Now, from a business perspective, we recently saw a regional office of Moderna established in South Korea as the uh, biotech firm and South Korea explore potential areas of collaboration for mRNA vaccine R&D and local manufacturing opportunities. Well, as Korea has designated the biotech and pharmaceutical industry as one of the future growth engines, the Korean government has been placing particular emphasis on enhancing the growth potential by implementing far-reaching policy measures and attracting fresh investments. What's your forecast of South Korea's biotech and farm industry? Well, I, I can't say for, for all of the industry, but there are four companies that I've been an advisor to uh, in, in, in Korea, um, you know, MEPSGEN, uh, Genuv, uh, APROBIO, and, and uh, Gene Medicine. And, they're all terrific. I mean, they're coming up with new, some of the, they're all working on different things, but, you know, one is working on brain diseases, another on cancer, another on like sort of organoids to do enhanced drug testing, another on what are called bispecific antibodies that could be useful for many treatments. And the scientists at these companies are terrific. So I, I've been extremely impressed with them. So if the four that I'm working with are any uh, you know, representation of the rest of Korea, I think you'll do very well. And then, as I've said, I've, I've also had the pleasure of interacting with a number of terrific uh, Korean companies that are doing great science. So it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to do this with you. And what about, what about yourself, Professor Langer? I mean, it's quite obvious that you have foresight as you saw the value in Moderna when no one else did it decade ago, what kind of uh, other sectors are you looking at now? Yeah, well, we're working on all kinds of things in our lab. Um, so we're working on, on new ways of, giving, of, of, of providing, much better ways of providing nutrition. Um, in fact, it started with the Gates Foundation. We're working on pills you could swallow that could last for, you know, a, a month or a week. Uh, we're, we are working on new vaccine delivery systems. Um, and we're even developing pills that you could swallow that could deliver vaccines orally or, or could deliver insulin orally. We're working on that with Nova Nordisk. We're working on uh, diseases for the back of the eye. Um, uh, so, so, so there are many, many different diseases that uh, we're working on. And, and of course, we start new companies uh, as well, spinning out from the work we've done at MIT. For example, we've developed a gastrointestinal tract on a chip that can, I think, tremendously speed up drug, drug testing. We're even working at MIT on a brain on a chip. So there, there are a lot of exciting things that I, I, I hope and think we're doing. Very exciting indeed. As um, a needle phobic myself, I look forward to those pills that we can swallow for vaccines and whatnot. Robert Langer, professor at MIT and one of the founders of Moderna, many thanks for speaking with us today. We appreciate it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Along with biotech and health, semiconductors and future mobility are also areas South Korea is targeting as innovative growth sectors, the three industries dubbed the Big Three. Officials here point out that the Big Three are at the core of key agendas that the global economies have been pursuing in the COVID era, including the overhaul of the global value chains, transition into a digital and green society, and the race towards future technologies and industries. Korea's vision for future mobility and chips together with the Korean New Deal. Check it out. Hello everyone, my name is Yuk Shin, and I oversee the New Deal Fund team at Korea Growth Investment Corporation. We've started a wind power project at Mount Omi or Omisan in Bongwa, Gyeongsangbuk-do province. The Omisan wind power project will undertaken by Korea Southern Power, a state energy utility, Unison, a private wind power company, and the New Deal Fund. It will be a wind power plant generating 63 megawatts with a total project investment of $135 million, out of which $60.7 million came from the New Deal Fund. A key aspect of the project is bringing in the participation of local residents. Residents will be able to invest in the project by converting public compensation, which will be distributed to the locals into convertible fund issued to them so that they can take a share of the profits from the wind power project during its 20-year operational lifetime. The Korea Gross Investment Corporation is running the fund which is making the Omisa wind power project possible. As a special fund of fund management agency, the Korea Gross Investment Corporation has built a war chest of $21.6 billion from some funds that Due capital from a $5.4 billion fund, which was deployed as venture capital. The fund will continuously carry out its low ratio premier state owned venture capital fund by funding private capital ventures backed by government policies. I'm here today to talk about the New Deal Fund, which is one of the many funds created by the Korea Growth Investment Corporation. I hope my session today will provide you with a better understanding of the New Deal Fund. In response to the changes in the global economy due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the South Korean government implemented the Korean New Deal to make the transition to a digital and green economy. The digital economy will integrate data analysis, AI, data dams, and much more in a way that will quickly transform both our daily lives and business activity. The transition to a less carbon emitting green economy is influencing industrial activity and financial investment. To ensure the success of Korean New Deal, the Korea Development Bank and Korea Growth Investment Corporation are pushing forward with the New Deal Fund. The structure of the New Deal Fund is as follows. It is divided into two categories, finance and the general public. In finance category, we plan to raise a total of $16.9 billion by drawing $6 billion from policy fund and $11 billion from private funds over the next five years. The funds that we've created will be divided into a corporate investment type, series and participatory type, and infrastructure investment fund. The first type is corporate investment method that makes investment in New Deal related firms. In this method, policy fund make anchor investment in venture capital or management participation type, PEFs, and raise private sector funding to create a fund, which it then invest in small and medium-sized enterprise and startups related to the New Deal. The second one is 
Citizen Participatory Type New Deal, which requires the general public to invest as individual investors. The underlying factor of the policy's success is public trust in the policy. The Citizen Participatory Type New Deal is a barometer of a bullish outlook. The fund was created with the purpose of sharing investment gains from the New Deal-related industry with the public. There was one fund that reached its 109 million funding goal quickly due to high public interest. The third type of fund invests in firms involved in New Deal-related infrastructure. We've invested in green companies related to the New Deal, such as solar power and wind power firms, as well as in tech businesses, such as data centers and smart logistics centers. Then, what will the New Deal investment look like? The New Deal investment guideline has chosen 40 areas to invest in. When not double counting, the seven areas that overlap between Digital New Deal and Green New Deal, there are 40 areas targets in the New Deal. In the Digital New Deal, there are 30 areas which included intelligence data analysis, smart healthcare, next generation chips, and fintech. While the Green New Deal encompasses 17 areas that include renewable energy, energy storage, environmental cleanup, and protection. The New Deal Fund provides various incentives to private investors and asset management companies. First of all, if a fund incurs a loss, the Polish fund will bear some of the first loss. The second is excess returns transfer, which transfers a certain percentage of the excess returns from the fund investment to private investors when the fund return rate exceeds the standard rate of return. The third is private investor corruption, which gives private investors the right to purchase policy fund shares at a predetermined exercise price when the investment period ends. The reason for providing such incentives is to foster a private sector that is creative, diverse, and more active in order to encourage better results. What is the status of the New Deal Fund? As of August 31st, 2021, 15 funds were formed with a combined capital of $456 million, of which $233 million was invested in various projects. 10 of these funds permitted individual investors to participate, and in corporate investment category, four firms invested in next-generation chips, healthcare sector, and more. The South Korean government needs to push forward with the Korean New Deal as a policy platform. To ensure the success of the platform, the support of citizens and their participation is vital, and the quickest way to achieving that is through the New Deal Fund. Looking into our past, there were decisive moments which the government, businesses, and domestic market were in lockstep and allowed for new growth engines to emerge that set our economy on a path of growth. These growth engines came about through the development of key industries such as the chemical industry and chip industry in the 1970s and information technology in the 2000s, which have led to the creation of today's largest South Korean tech companies. With the outbreak of COVID-19, we are facing another decisive moment in history, businesses, the domestic market, and the South Korean government are once again channeling their expertise and energy in a cohesive way through the Korean New Deal. Results are starting to appear after investments were made by New Deal Fund. Sinan Green New Deal Fund is an example of a successful investment fund. As the name suggests, the main focus of this fund was renewable energy, such as solar power, wind power, and fuel cells. In April 2021, $31 million in state policy fund was matched with $173 million in private funds 
to form a $200 million fund. The first project the fund invested in was the Omisam Wind Power Project, which I mentioned earlier. A portion of the project budget will also be set aside to cover public compensation to local residents. However, it will be set up in the form of a convertible fund issued to residents. This will give residents an investment stake in the wind power plant. Such an investment will deliver financial benefit to everyone. What the New Deal Fund is pursuing is a win-win outcome for businesses, citizens, and investment institutions. In the coming year of 2022, we will continuously grow the New Deal Funds to create new investment opportunities with the goal of achieving a digital and green economy. We wish that foreign investors as well as South Korean firms will take interest in the gross potential of Korea's New Deal sectors and also decide to invest. Thank you very much. Major developed countries have announced initiatives to achieve carbon neutrality and combat the climate crisis. Sweden, France and the UK have enacted legislation with carbon neutrality targets. And South Korea has also announced a Green New Deal in 2020 and pledged to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 with other countries. Expanding green infrastructure means a transition to green mobility such as electric cars, hydrogen fuel cell cars, and other vehicles. It's becoming an important factor in securing competitiveness in the mobility market. BMW라든지 그 아우디라든지 또 GM이라든지 많은 그런 회사들이 이제 수소 쪽에도 관심이 보이고 내년에 출시도 하는 회사들도 있고 그런데 우리가 지금 한발 앞서서 나가고 있는 것이 큰 우리 미래를 볼때 장점이 아니냐 이렇게 생각을 합니다. In 2013, Hyundai Motor succeeded in commercializing the world's first hydrogen fuel cell car and took the lead in the green mobility sector. Currently, the company is developing competitive technologies such as the full flat fuel cell system. Nexo system 같은 경우는 지금 어, 엔진점에 딱 들어가는데요. 지금 보시는 바와 같이 이런 그 플랫형 풀 플랫 시스템 같은 경우는 높이가 250대다 보니까 이게 들어갈 수 있는 다양한 애플리케이션이 있거든요. 상당히 애플리케이션이 많기 때문에 이렇게 높이를 낮게 지금 개발을 해왔고요. 어, 하다 보니까 이제 기술적인 허들이 있어서 남은 기간 동안에 이 허들을 극복하면서 어, 개발을 해야 될것 같습니다. Hyundai Motor presented various future mobility technologies based on hydrogen fuel cells to the world in their Hydrogen Wave virtual event. A hydrogen fuel cell car doesn't require a powertrain like an internal combustion engine vehicle. Thus, it is highly efficient in converting energy. It is also eco-friendly as its only byproduct is pure water and water vapors while emitting zero carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxide. This is what gives hydrogen fuel a competitive edge in the mobility sector. Hydrogen is known to be highly efficient and eco-friendly and excels in energy conversion, energy storage capacity, and long-distance travel. It has emerged as the best alternative energy that can also be price competitive compared to solar power, wind power, and natural gas, depending on the way the latter three are generated and transported. The world's first hydrogen mobility event, H2 Mobility and Energy Show, was held in South Korea to usher in the hydrogen economy. It was an opportunity to reaffirm South Korea's standing as a world leader in hydrogen fuel cell technology, while also showcasing advanced technologies that boast outstanding performance. 수소 산업에 있어서 그 수소의 생산, 저장, 이동뿐만 아니라 수소 모빌리티로 대표되는 이런 그 활용 분야도 
다른 나라보다 우리가 좀 빨리 움직였기 때문에 여기에서 사업 기회가 많다 이렇게 생각하는 것 같아요. Hyundai Heavy Industry Group possesses the best technology in achieving high energy efficiency, such as harnessing offshore wind power and other renewable energy sources. Hyundai is creating a new hydrogen ecosystem that encompasses hydrogen production, transportation, and storage. Hyundai는 특히 이제 운송과 저장에서 이제 확연한 강점이 있는 것이고요. 수소와 같은 그런 우리가 새로운 에너지 저장돼 있어서 당사에 그거 사용했던 기술력으로 저희가 솔루션을 제공할 것입니다. Tucson Fuel Cell leads the domestic market in fuel cell power generators and became the first Korean company to export hydrogen fuel cells for power generation overseas. The Trigen fuel cell under development at Tucson Fuel Cell can produce hydrogen, electricity and heat at the same time from natural gas like LPG. And this can significantly reduce the cost of transporting high-pressure hydrogen. POSCO is South Korea's largest steel company and also developing eco-friendly hydrogen-based reduction and conversion technology. It's an innovative technology that uses hydrogen instead of coal to make steel from iron ore. It does not use coal, so it generates nearly zero carbon emissions. If the fuel cell is used, it can be used to use the fuel cell as well as the fuel cell energy. 그 선점을 할수 있을 것으로 기대하고 있습니다. The leading technology in hydrogen fuel mobility that South Korean companies possess is one step ahead of the competition and has caught the attention of foreign firms. Producing green hydrogen is necessary for us in Sweden and then we want to work together with the Korean companies on doing that. I think Korea is attractive for foreign companies because of the direction that they're taking with the hydrogen economy. Based on advanced hydrogen fuel technology that has become the focal point of global attention, South Korea is developing its mobility industry with an eye on the future. This technology will unleash the country's growth potential. Hello everyone, my name is Kim Yang Peng and I oversee research in the semiconductor industry at the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade. Today, I would like to talk about the current state of South Korea's semiconductor industry and the oversized role that our semiconductor industry plays in the global semiconductor industry. I will give a brief overview of the K-semiconductor strategy that was announced by the South Korea government in May 2021, and our openness to international cooperation regarding the K-semiconductor belt. As most of you are aware, South Korea is a major player in semiconductors and has the second largest share of the global semiconductor market following the United States. American families, chip companies, and integrated device manufacturers are well-established firm, while in Korea, integrated device manufacturers focusing on memory chip production are strong players. Especially notable is the fact that South Korean memory chips had a commanding lead of the global market, last year taking 56.9% of the global market. Korean companies entered the semiconductor market in the 1980s amidst fierce competition between US and Japan firms in the global semiconductor market. In just 10 years, Samsung developed the world's first 64 megabit DRAM in the 1992 and has since become a leader in the memory chip industry. Due to the emergence of new electronics and services, the global semiconductor market has grown in size every year. In 1980, the global semiconductor market was a $10 billion market. 
but surpasses 100 billion dollar in 1995, and this year it is expected to reach 500 billion dollar. During this time, there have been many changes among the market leaders and the countries with major chip players. The US invented the first semiconductor chip, but Japan and Korea took the lead in memory chip market. In the above figure, you can see that the semiconductor manufacturing process encompasses design, vapor fabrication, and packaging testing. U.S. chip pubs are strong in which process, including chip design, whereas Japanese and European companies have become suppliers of chip making equipment and key material for chip production. South Korea and Taiwan buy equipment and materials from other countries to manufacture semiconductor. While neighboring Asian countries have become capable in the back end process, which is packaging and testing. This global supply chain has made it possible to manufacture semiconductors efficiently, and many believed that the global supply chain was stable. However, a disruption in the supply of chips used in the automobile has resulted in the idling of auto factories since last year. Earlier this year, President Biden of the United States issued an executive order to examine the chip supply chain. In addition, the U.S. government passes a bill to support chip manufacturing to strengthen the chip supply chain. Europe has also announced their goal to rise chip production to 20% of the global supply. While Japan was with TSMC to revive its chip industry, a leading country in the foundry business, Taiwan, has also made it clear that it will continuously expand the production and development of advanced chips. These actions taken by various countries will inevitably affect the global supply chain for chips. I earlier mentioned that South Korea has a strong chip industry, and memory chip is one business that South Korea dominates. Despite the fact that today's global supply chain was established over many decades outside of South Korea, the country was able to grow into a major supplier of memory chips. Since the necessary know-how and expertise for production memory chips is very advanced, it is difficult for new players to enter the memory chip as building a chip plans require billions of dollars in investment. South Korean chip firms have also survived two rounds of the game of chicken in the cyclical chip industry. And in this process, they have picked up know-how in the depending their market share. Any new entrants in the memory chip market will face a myriad of uh, challenges. While countries have announced the support for the domestic production of semiconductor, hardly any of them include plans to manufacture memory chips. I believe the reason for this I do to the fact that South Korea has proven that it offers stable production of memory chips within its abroad and will continue to supply chips to the world without any major disruptions. More recently, South Korea proved it can deliver on time despite Japan's export controls on key materials used in chips. Now, let's talk about COVID-19. Due to the COVID pandemic, whole industries and factories across the globe have shut down, causing supply disruption. However, chip production in Korea has operated smoothly without any problem and has actually increasing chip making capacity to grow export. The role of the government played in supporting the stable expansion of the domestic chip industry 
cannot be discounted despite change in market conditions. Furthermore, the Korean government unveiled the K semiconductor belt strategy in May 2021 to ensure that the chip industry will stay on path of growth in an ever exchange environment. As part of the K semiconductor belt strategy, the Korean government will take the lead in not only supporting investment in chip makers, but also build infrastructure and train workers. This is an indication of the government will be further development chip industry. In addition, we plan to build a stronger chip ecosystem through the K Semiconductor Belt, building upon the domestic chip provision that was formal over decades. The purpose of the K Semiconductor Belt is to create an ecosystem that ensures the stable production of chips regardless of any external shocks. Because South Korea is the largest manufacturing base for memory chips, demand for material and manufacturing equipment is also significant. Korea is regularly ranked second or third in the world in terms of its demand for chip materials. In the chip making equipment market, South Korea is one of the top three consumers for such equipment. In the future, it is predicted that South Korea will become the largest consumer of chip making equipment in the world. The K semiconductor belt also allocates land for material and chip making equipment firms and the Korean government will lend support equally to foreign and domestic companies. The K Semiconductor Belt will be reborn as the center of global chip production in order to guarantee supply of crucial components to the world. And we believe you can grow together with the K Semiconductor Belt. Thank you very much. Brought to you by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy of the Republic of Korea and COTRA. You're watching Invest Korea Week 2021 on Arirang TV. Korea's burgeoning businesses with bright prospects in the wake of the pandemic in the digital economy, biohealthcare and materials, parts and equipment industries. So why Korea? Where does Korea's investment value lie? For an evaluation of Korea's investment environment against the post-COVID global investment climate, why don't we take a moment for some perspective from a business standpoint on the innovative growth form segment, Invest Korea Week 2021. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Cheng, the Commissioner of Invest Korea. In past two years, we have faced dramatic changes to the world economy due to COVID. The world economy went through a trying period and we've witnessed a global value chain undergo an upheaval while foreign direct investment dried up and fear for succession occurring was real. Fortunately, South Korea have survived rather smoothly than the most with the economy showing signs of recovery while FDI inflows remain steady. 
We'll be discussing the Korean health of South Korea 2021 from a business standpoint and talk to foreign business leaders who are investing and conducting business here in Korea. We're meeting with the leaders of foreign firms operating in South Korea at the IKW 2021 Innovate Growth Forum. First, let me introduce you to our guests. First, we have Mr. Sean Blakely, CEO of British Chamber of Commerce in Korea. Hello, Sean. Hi, Sean. Nice meeting you. And we have here with us Mr. Hawkins Servell, President and CEO of Ericsson LG. Hello, Hawkins. Hello, pleasure being here. And we also have Francis Van Perry's, Saitiba Asia Pacific's Vice President. Hello, Hi. thank you for coming. Great to be here. Also joining us today, Vice President Mark Beltel Hertz of BASF Korea. Hello. Hi, Sean. Thanks a lot for inviting. We also have James E. Faltasek, Senior Vice President of 3M Korea, will be with us via video link later. Let's kick off our discussion by hearing from Sean. As a CEO of the British Chamber of Commerce in Korea, I'm sure if the pandemic has kept you busy enough. And please tell me about some activities BCCK is engaged in to strengthen industrial ties between the UK and South Korea. Okay, so first of all, Sean, thank you very much for inviting me here today, and it's a pleasure to be alongside these panelists to discuss this topic. So let me just tell you a little bit about some of the activities that we do. So first of all, you know, every chamber has different priorities, but a big priority for us is actually to advocate on behalf of members that are here, which is primarily British companies, but also a huge part of what we do is facilitate trade and investment between the two countries. So we are primarily focused on inbound, meaning the UK coming into Korea. And so we're really interested in promoting the opportunities for UK companies in an area where the UK is strong and mm -hmm. where partnerships can be built. We also do elements of outbound as well. So you know, we will, for example, work with Korean economic free zones or with different departments in the government in order to promote opportunities also for Korean companies to go to the UK. And so those activities Pre-COVID days, you know, a lot of offline visits to the UK, you know, dignitaries coming here, whether that's private sector CEOs or it's government officials in the UK. Now, you know, with the limitations we have, a lot more sort of online uh, webinars or we're having online forums by which people can still exchange and meet each other. And so we are still able to be very active in this area, but of course with limitations. So, yeah, th that's just a flavor of some of the activities that we do have. Okay, so basically what we do in Invest Korea, we're definitely getting a lot of help from BCCK as well. And you're holding everything on the virtually, just like the rest of the world. That's right. Right. And the world st is still in turmoil due to spread of COVID-19. And what changes you see in Korea's climate for business and investment during the pandemic? Okay, so I think if you, first of all, look at the situation that we have here, in particular in Korea, I think it's fair to say that in terms of the prevention of the spread of the virus, Korea has been possibly number one. It's a world leading in its reaction to the pandemic. So I, I think that's helped to you know, boost Korea's image internationally. And right. I can tell you that whether it's the UK or elsewhere, I was receiving a lot of calls about you know, how it was that Korea was able to mm -hmm. do such a fantastic job. So I think, you know, in, in a sense, it's actually been positive. Korea's also recovered very quickly to pre-pandemic pre numbers in terms of its economy. And actually, you've seen really good and, and positive FDI numbers as well. So I think that's testament to the work you're doing, but also yes. the qualities of the Korean economy. So what does it mean aside from that? Well, I think actually this has been an opportunity for Korea to re-look at where it needs to be stronger. And, you know, the government has put forward two initiatives on the digital side and also the energy side, which I think is a com as a consequence of you know, understanding what the impact of something like a pandemic can be. And actually, incidentally, that t that's in an area where the UK is very strong. And so actually, it's been an opportunity for our two countries. And also, uh, despite some of the hardships and the sort of initial limitations. Yeah, so I think actually, you know, now the climate is pretty positive And it's now about really getting back to business. So in summary, the Korea has shown economic resilience in returning to pre-pandemic, but there still exist a lot of challenges to face. That's right. Okay, thank you. And naturally, the telecommunication industry is not exempt from the uh, impact of COVID-19. The telecom industry and communication-based economy activity will also be affected substantially. 
And we have here with us Hawken, president and CEO of Ericsson LG. And I would like to ask you about the current state and pr prospect of the telecommunication industry, and also touch upon South Korean market. I, I, uh, first of all, I think the pandemic, which mm -hmm. is something that has influenced uh, everyone around the globe for yes. the last one and a half year. Um, and of course, it created a lot of challenges for, for both individuals and for, uh, for enterprises. Uh, and even though I think that uh, Korea has responded to this in a very impressive way, right. in both in terms of, of uh, tests and, and, and vaccinations, there is actually one thing that has been very positive from an ICT mm -hmm. and from a telecommunication perspective. Because we predicted all the time that digital transformation would happen, both for consumers and for enterprises. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic has actually accelerated that trend quite significantly. So what we see now is that a lot of individuals around the world are very used to using ICT tools for video conferencing right. or webinars. And we see many enterprises that have accelerated digital transformation because they mm. need to do business in a different way. They need to reach out to the customers in a different way. So from an Ericsson perspective, we actually see that the use of ICT, mm -hmm. the use of telecommunication, and use of 5D has actually been accelerated. Right. And, and let me just share some numbers when it comes to Korea. Today in Korea, there are already 17 million 5D subscribers. Korea was number one to 5D a couple of years ago, the first market in the world. Now there are 17 million subscribers. And we actually now predict, after the pandemic, mm -hmm. that by 2026, there will be 3.5 billion 5D subscribers. So 5D is happening now, and this digital transformation is happening now, actually. And, and I think Korea is a leading market, both that they were first when it comes to 5G, but Korea will continue to drive this digital transformation. So all the new things, both from consumers and for enterprises, is likely to happen here in Korea. Wow, the numbers are crazy. So I see that COVID-19 has created an unexpected situation, but it could also turn into an opportunity, you're saying? Absolutely. Awesome. Francis, I have a question for you. The biotech industry has become focus of attention ever since COVID-19. News about the drug and biotech companies are always on the papers, right? And Cytiva is a biotech firm that plays a key role in the industry. And your company made a surprise on that last month to make an investment in Korea. And what were the reasons behind your investment? Good, so well, Cytiva is, uh, is a global player <clears throat> that enables the um, manufacturing of bio biopharmaceutical drugs as well as vaccines. You can imagine, as a result of the pandemic, the demand uh, for these products has surged dramatically, exponentially, in oh, fact. Yes. And so the industry, as well as Cytiva, has uh, decided to increase its capacity uh, mm -hmm. as fast and as rapidly as, as, as we can. Um, as part of uh, our global expansion program, uh, we have um, announced an investment in, in Korea indeed, mm -hmm. and that is not only to enable the manufacturing of um, COVID-19 uh, vaccines and therapeutics, uh, but equally so uh, to support the industry in its growth going forward. The um, biotech industry in Korea is one of the um, future um, drivers of economic growth in this country. Um, we, we see that as a very positive regulatory environment uh, for our company. Um, we see a very vibrant ecosystem of uh, startup companies uh, that um, you know, we see in the biotech sector alone about 500 companies joining this sector every year. Uh, so to support the growth of the industry, we felt it was important for us uh, to have a strong manufacturing presence in this mm -hmm. country, um, to enable its growth, uh, to manufacture high quality products with short lead time uh, to local firms, but equally, equally so to be a hub uh, for the broader region. So uh, while the initial intent is to support uh, growth in Korea for Korea, uh, it is also going to be in Korea for the broader region. Great. So I have one more question for you. So what kind of shift have you witnessed in the global biotech industry after COVID-19? And how has it impacted South Korea's biotech industry in particular? I think the biotech industry was already 
pretty thriving before uh, pandemic hit. Um, it was a fast growing industry and it obviously was accelerated further by, by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, the industry globally has been expanding its capacity. Um, you know, if you think about the global capacity that was existing for vaccine manufacturing before the pandemic, um, it was about 10% of what is needed now. Uh, so you can imagine uh, the, the growth and uh, the acceleration that the industry has, uh, has gone through. So what I believe that will generate um, is, is, is further mainstream attention to this attention, uh, to this industry, more VC funding. Um, I expect um, more um, risk uh, to be taken in this industry to development, to, to fuel the development of future uh, therapeutics. Um, the other thing we've learned is that um, a vaccine can be manufactured um, or developed and manufactured in the space of six to nine months, which is unprecedented in the industry. And the reason that was possible is because of an unprecedented level of collaboration between academics, governments, governmental stakeholders, uh, biopharma players of large size and medium size. And so that collaboration, I think, will, uh, will, will be something that we will continue to see as it has um, yielded un unprecedented uh, results. So for the Korea bio industry, you know, even given some of the uh, limitations we've seen in the past year or so, the export of uh, biopharmaceuticals has risen more than 60%. You know, the commitment of the government is, is uh, absolutely uh, very clear in terms of making this a growth engine for the economy. Um, the ambition of the government is to have um, exports of biopharmaceuticals rise to about $50 billion uh, uh, on an annual basis and create about 300,000 jobs. So um, that commitment um, is going to mm. drive an enormous level of innovation uh, and collaboration uh, within this uh, economy. And so I'm really excited about that. And uh, we look forward to playing a role in supporting that growth by by having infrastructure here, by um, driving the education of new professionals joining this industry, because that's a real shortage uh, for the industry. So in other words, um, collaboration and support from government, as well as the current cluster of bio industry in Korea, is definitely one of your strong points for your investment decision. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. OK, now let's talk about the condition in chemical industry. We and Mark. I know BSF generated over 1.6 billion euros in South Korea with the strong sales of high value added products and in spite of ongoing COVID-19. And how did your company accomplish such outstanding results? First of all, thanks a lot for having me on stage and, and I would like to, to go a step back into 2020 because that's what we are talking about. Right. In 2020, Korea was the second country after China where the pandemic broke out. Mm. And we were from the very beginning heavily affected um, by had to create uh, contingency plans uh, by making sure that our people are safe. Uh, one measure we took, for example, was sending them home. And this was a completely new um, way of working for these people. And I would say that the main success factors are actually three. Uh, the first one is definitely the team. It was an excellent team who, under completely new circumstances, took the opportunity and with um, being creative, uh, with being open, responsible, showing an entrepreneurial way of, of spirit, really making the success possible by working remote from home. That's number one. Um, the second one is definitely our broad product portfolio we have in BSF. Uh, many, many uh, segments we are uh, producing in Korea, but also outside of Korea. And uh, we can make uh, a big advantage out of this, the strength of BSF. And what, would, what we should not forget is actually also uh, that the world economy kicked back mm -hmm. and uh, gave us a bit of, of tailwind uh, to make this success happen. That's pretty modest answer you gave us. So BASF has had a presence in Korea since 1950s. And could you tell us more about your main areas of business in Korea? You're well informed. So indeed, we entered uh, the Korean market in 1954. And that was directly after the Korean War. And, yes. and with our products, we helped this country uh, to rebuild itself. And um, I think you see what we have today, that it was mm -hmm. a big success. Um, and in the second step, which the older generation has also not forgotten yet, 
the IMF crisis, 1997, yes. um, many, many companies decided to leave the country, to not take the risk and stay in this country. And we as BSF, we clearly decided we take this as an opportunity and further invest. What we did so far is we are now talking about a footprint of, of eight world-scale production sites in this country, mainly located uh, at the coast um, with headquarter in Seoul, uh, which, which have also a huge portfolio of products we are producing here. And this is really something which uh, made us strong, which we are very proud of. And uh, I think there's a, a good future to go in this country for our company. You're the one of the oldest companies to invest it in Korea as a foreign company. And thank you for your contribution throughout. And BSF Korea plays an important role in serving customers not only in South Korea, but across entire Asia. We hope that it will surpass everyone's expectations in this regard. Today, our society is undergoing the fourth industrial revolution. First industrial revolution, which began in England in the 18th century, has continually progressed. Digital technology underpins this fourth industrial revolution and it's juxtaposed with another pressing trend, which is the green movement. The economic policy of South Korean government that is manifested in a digital new deal and green new deal is proactive measure to embrace the inevitable fourth industrial revolution. So what is the opinion of foreign companies concerning Korean new deal? The United Kingdom was a birthplace of industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution era is probably causing British companies to quickly adapt. What changes are the British companies are going through in South Korea, and how do you see the digital New Deal and Green New Deal policies have impact on them? Okay, so that's a great question. I think it's been alluded to earlier that, of course, you know, COVID has expedited mm -hmm. uh, some behavioral habits and also certain adoptions and, and willingness to, to take on a further digitization of the economy. So I think with that comes the need to adapt. And, and I, I think the government has seen an opportunity to focus on two areas yeah. where I think Korea is already strong and really has the infrastructure, the mm. human capital, and also the companies to really become a global leader in that. Right. But has chosen to, you know, I think rather than create a revolution, maybe push and be an active participant in enhancing and uh, speeding up an evolution of, of the Korean economy. And I think British companies are embracing that. So I, I, I really think that there are some great measures in there in, in the two new deals that you mentioned, particularly, mm -hmm. of course, around energy and, and digital. UK companies that are already here are adapting and they have the partners and the knowledge of the market with which to do that. And I think where the policies really help is actually those companies that are not yet here and also to make it more appealing for them mm -hmm. to choose Korea ahead of other markets and how they prioritize because of the support that they know they will receive. And not only from the government, for, from, from stakeholders also uh, within the governmental system, but also the non-governmental system as well, as well as the private sector. Right, right. And so I think they are adapting accordingly, okay. but the value in doing that is clearly there. So in other words, um, the Korean New Deal policy will closely connect Korean companies to overseas companies. It will certainly, I think, facilitate mm -hmm. and increase the appeal and then enhance the value proposition for UK companies to do that, uh, to create a win-win for sure. Okay, thank you. The main driver of the fourth industrial revolution is undoubtedly breaking the speed of advances in information technology. Two years ago, South Korea held the title of being the world's first country to begin commercial 5G mobile communication network, and it confirmed that Korea was the leading edge of the information technology. And as a head of telecommunication company, what do you think the source of Korea's competitiveness in IT industry, Hawken? Well, I think there are many things, actually. And, and, um, but I think I would like to start by saying that from an Ericsson perspective, mm -hmm. uh, Korea has always been an attractive market uh, because of its competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, I'm not only proud of what we are doing here today, right. it also goes way back. As a matter of fact, uh, Ericsson signed the first contract in Korea mm -hmm. in 1896, where we were selling a telephone switch to the Chosen Dynasty. So I think it's history is something that is very important for us as a company, and it matches very well with, uh, with Korea. 
As you said, Korea was the number one to, uh, to 5G. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, 90 minutes ahead of US and the Verizon operator there. So, so I think this is part of the competitiveness that Korea mm -hmm. companies, individuals are always aiming to be number one. So I think that's one reason. Yes. Then I think Korea is unique in a few different ways. One is, of course, that operators and ICT companies are pushing technology to the limit. That goes for operators like SKT or KT or LDU Plus, but also mm -hmm. other ICT companies. Then Korea has extremely demanding consumers. Yes. As a matter of fact, I would say the most demanding consumers in the world. They are never satisfied, always asking for more. <laughs> and the reason why this is good is uh -huh. that that is pushing us as a technology leader to the limit for how we can get new technology to the market and how we can make use of that. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing, which I think is unique, and especially if you compare with Europe, for example, is that the Korean government is very active in driving ICT, technology, and 5G. They are connecting technologies such as 5G to objectives for, for the country, such as GDP growth, or creating new jobs, or increasing the, uh, the export for, for, for Korean companies. So, all these things together it has pushed us to be the biggest foreign investor in ICT um, to make sure that we have R&D here in Korea. That is the way to meet the expectation and the demands for the extremely fast market in Korea. And the final thing I would like to say is, um, as a joke, people in, in my headquarter in Sweden are sometimes mm -hmm. asking, you know, what is so different with Korea and what is so unique and what, what is the best with you, uh, Korea? And I normally say, that's because of the country code. Oh. The country code <laughs> of Korea is, as yes. you know, 82, right. if you want to make an international call. And, and in Korean, it's Balship E, combination <laughs> of, of Bal and E. So right. Bali, and then it becomes Bali Bali. And I think that mindset of Bali Bali, trying to do something extremely fast, is one of the main reasons why we want to be in this market. It's true what Hawkins said, you know, Bali Bali, which means fast, fast. So Koreans like to do everything fast. I think that's one of the reasons, great reasons, why 5G was the first adapted in Korea, and also all the IT technology has been, you know, very early adapted by, you know, by Korean people. So South Korean government is proposing various economic policies for innovations such as Digital New Deal and Green New Deal initiatives. So I presume this will have a great impact on Ericsson's business. What changes do you expect these policies will bring? I, you're absolutely right, and, and that's also what Sean said earlier, that um, this will accelerate the digital transformation mm -hmm. in Korea. I think the the commitment from, these, uh, from the Korean government and, and the Korean New Deal is providing means and funds, uh -huh. uh, but also motivation for companies to go early for new type of services and making sure that it's also done in the green way or the sustainable uh -huh. way. So acceleration is, is, is a key word when it comes to the Korean New Deal. Again, since even the Korean government is connecting the Korean New Deal to 5G, mm -hmm. and that is the main technology that we are providing. Of course, we see a direct connection between a successful Korean New Deal implementation and our business, because this will put tremendous requirements on the, uh, on the networks. Right. Because the networks in the future, they do not only need to be fast. Mm -hmm. They need to provide low latency, as we say. They need to manage everything being connected, all devices being connected. So that's maybe the digital part of the Korean New Deal. When it comes to the green part, um, this is very important for me personally, and it's important for, for, for Ericsson. Right. So there are uh, research that is actually saying that the ICT industry can reduce the carbon emission by 15% by 2030. It's not that many industries that can make that claim. So. ICT industry and different type of solution will be contributing to the, to the green new deal and implementing those, uh, those objectives. And then I think all companies, and it doesn't matter if you're an ICT company in any industry, it's also important that we commit. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Ericsson, we have made one commitment and we have set one objective, and that is by 2030, mm -hmm. 
i.e. In, uh, in nine years' time, we will be a carbon neutral company within our mm. own operations. Wow, so there, is, there definitely is an intersect, even the telecommunication industry with a digital new deal, but also a green new deal. And you said by 2030, you're gonna be 100% carbon neutral company, wow. BASF is a leading German chemical company that also presents leading edge of Europe. And for chemical companies, the situation in which business conditions are changing regarding environmental issues is both crisis and I think it's opportunity as well. So please explain how BASF business paradigm shift is taking place and how it relates to Korea's Green New Deal policy. That's an excellent question, Sean. Um, first of all, I'm personally very proud uh, about BSF's company purpose, mm -hmm. which is we create chemistry for a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. We in BSF um, have since 1990 halved the carbon emissions while we were doubling the uh, volume of our sales products. Um, so I would say, and, and the same again, when, when you talk about uh, risk taking in, in the year 1997 with the IMF crisis, we definitely see this as an opportunity and we will take it as an opportunity. Um, by that, we, we have put similar targets as the Korean New Deal. Uh, we announced in, in March this year that we will have, well, that we will make BSF carbon neutral by 2050. How will we do that? Uh, definitely by using our uh, high efficient and, and low carbon uh, solutions. Thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing BASF to rise one of the top companies leading the way for the Green New Deal initiatives. So besides um, the digital New Deal and Green New Deal, the Korean government is also focusing its energy on fostering biotech industry. So Francis, what are your expectations for Korea's biotech industry policy from a corporate standpoint? Korean government in uh, announced its uh, intention to become a global vaccine hub. Um, and so uh, that's another 1.9 billion commitment of investment into, into the country in the next couple of years. So it's hugely exciting. Yeah. Um, and so the commitment from the Korean government is clear. It um, essentially uh, leads to a number of policies that, uh, that help this industry flourish. Uh, mm -hmm. Policies that have created a very effective um, technologically a very um, advanced and, uh, ec and strong ex with strong expertise around um, drug approval process. Um, Seoul and South Korea um, has been recognized globally as one of the uh, most effective places to do clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so all these policies um, uh, absolutely help uh, this, this industry to evolve at the speed that it does. Um, I mean, the final piece I would mention is around um, the, the, the number of professionals that are needed to support the growth of this industry. Um, and uh, uh, the Korean government has announced a collaboration with uh, the Korean version of NIBERT, which is a, an ed educational um, uh, body, uh, to bring in the next four years about 50,000 new professionals to this market to support the growth. So wow. all of these indications mm -hmm. of uh, policies to support the growth of the industry is, is, is hugely exciting to see and, and really much aligned with our expectations. Mm -hmm. and, and we are, um, as a, a global uh, provider to this industry, uh, looking forward to partner and, and, and support these measures uh, even better in the future than we do today. Thank you very much. So that's uh, Francis' view about South Korea's biotech industry and how he expects to see more results as an investment flow into the sector. So now we'll talk to another panel guest through a video link. Our next guest, was an attendee for IKW 2020 last year. We have James Faltersek, Senior Vice President of 3M Korea. It's great to see you again. So 2020 was a year the COVID-19 dominated every corner of our lives. What was it like for 3M in 2020? First of all, let me just say it's my great pleasure to be here again this year. Thank you. Um, I would say that 3M has had three priorities driving us during this global pandemic. Number one, the safety of our employees. Number two, ensuring we get 3M solutions that can make a difference to the front line. So meaning like first responders and medical personnel. And number three, continuing to understand the needs for innovative solutions where we can help the world move forward 
and commercializing those solutions as fast as we can. So first to point two, as a leading provider of personal protective equipment worldwide, 3M has more than tripled our production since 2019. And we're continuing to increase production while working with governments and others to prioritize and direct supplies to serve the most critical needs both for today and building stockpiles for the future. For 3M, which makes consumer goods and wide range of products, this Korean initiative could be a challenging, but at the same time, it could open up new opportunities for you. Could you tell us how your company is planning for the future? Yeah, 3M created our strategic sustainability framework to really focus on three priority areas that align with shared global needs. So the first one being science for circular. So starting in 2019, we implemented a policy that every new product has a sustainability benefit. We're designing solutions that do more with less material. And then in 2021, we announced plans to reduce the usage of virgin fossil-based plastic by 57 million kilograms by 2025. Science for Climate, second pillar, uh, we have both the math and the path to bending the curve on carbon emissions and reducing water usage. And the third pillar, Science for Community, where we really hope to create a more positive world through science and inspire the next generation of scientists. So we're looking to influence a more diverse generation of scientists that will solve the new problems facing new generations. We've been doing that for 17 years with our 3M Science Camp. We've served over 1,700 middle school students. And this year we did our camp in a virtual format, another new innovation, where we had 53% female students. So we believe this framework really aligns well with the goals and objectives of the Korean New Deal to build a sustainable future for all of us. Yes, I think um, the Green New Deal could be another stepping stone for 3M. And over the past 40 years, 3M Korea has increased in investment in Korea and also expanded operations across the country. Is there any company plans going forward which you, could, which you would like to highlight? Okay, at our core, 3M is really a science company. So we strive to innovate, create, develop, and commercialize science that can advance companies and improve lives. So you think about displays for phones and TVs, semiconductors, biopharma, electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells, industries that Korea is focused on as growth drivers are also key areas of focus for 3M and 3M Korea. So those are the areas we'd be planning to invest in, both R&D and manufacturing perspectives. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing your company play a big role in Korea again. And it's great pleasure meeting you. So, all right, that was uh, James Faltasek, Senior Vice President of 3M Korea. Now let's talk about the future strategy of foreign firms in South Korea and what they think about Korea as a place to invest in. Again, I'm going to ask Sean again. You're also an international student in South Korea before you started your business career, right? And could you tell me what were the qualities of Korea that made it attractive to you from both personal and business perspective yeah. in Korean? For sure, I can tell you. My, so my story is uh, quite interesting in the sense that, you know, mm -hmm. typically if you have uh, someone in the business community uh, who's uh, from overseas and in Korea, often, you know, they're, they're sent here to lead a company or to work in an organization. In my case, I took a little bit of a longer journey. So I actually came here initially in 2004 working for a Korean company and learned, you know, how to, to do well in that type of environment, but quickly realized, you know, for really for me to do well here, I had to learn the language. So I actually returned to the UK and was lucky enough to win a Korean government mm -hmm. scholarship. So actually, I, that's another thing I have to thank the Korean government for because they were kind enough to select me as the sole representative of, for the UK, and they actually paid for my studies here. So one okay. very practical reason was that they were very helpful in, in, in making that economically possible for me. The reason I was interested in Korea beyond the scholarship was actually to do with political economy. So I, I came here and I was at Seoul National University. Mm -hmm. I studied my master's. In, as you know, in Korea, you have Gukche Daegwon and you have Ilban Daegwon. I was in Ilban Daegwon. So it really, the reason I came was because Korea has 
done such amazing things economically and politically in mm -hmm. such a short time, and I wanted to learn. And so I went into the private sector after that, actually, and then worked in consulting around bringing companies to the market. So mm -hmm. acting as a bridge, and I, I still remain in that type of function now. And so on a personal level, I came here to learn. And, and now that I've learned it, I see the opportunities. And I'm, I'm actually in a position now where I'm, I'm kind of teaching people. So yeah, so the, <laughs> the roles have been changed, and it was a, certainly an interesting journey. OK, let's get back to economy issues. So after Brexit, I would think there is a changed perspective of South Korea from British companies. And can you tell us about investment mood among British companies towards South Korea? Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, over the last few years, the UK has um, been in the, in the news a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly around a referendum that we held that, that led for, for, for its merits to um, us uh, leaving the European Union and, and you, know, you know, to going it alone. But we're not really going it alone. I mean, we still have, you know, fantastic relationship with our, our biggest trading partner, which is the EU, and of course with the US, and of course here in Asia. I think what it has done, it's um, it sort of um, made us realize that we need to increase our trade with maybe those partners that aren't necessarily nearby, uh, and I would count Korea amongst that. Korea, as you know, has signed the most FTAs globally, so. It is a free trading nation, and it has a very good relationship with the UK. So UK companies are interested and open for business, and they want to work in Korea. And so Brexit has actually, I think, helped this bilateral relationship. And I also, it's helped that the Korean government is signaling the same thing uh, in, in the way it signed its continuity FTA, and it was one of the first to do that. Right. And also, with, as I've already mentioned, the new deals that are very pertinent to us. So we have an extra opportunity as well because at the moment, you know, there is a, a potential renegotiation or at least amendments to be made to the Korea EU FTA. Mm -hmm. now, that's a pre-existing arrangement and that may take some time. For us, we're signing a new one within the next two years. So I think there's a real opportunity to you know, add some modern chapters around digital, around you know, e-commerce, around mm -hmm. FinTech, and these are all areas where the UK is strong. Next quick question goes to Hawken. As Ericsson LG is a telecommunication company, it is expected that your company will play a bigger role in South Korea, which is known for its communication sector. What areas of business are you planning to pursue in the future? I think what is really cool right uh -huh. now is that the world is changing. Mm -hmm. um, the world is changing in terms of how individuals, how enterprises behave, how they do business. And of course, it has been accelerated by the pandemic. But this transformation has already started, and it will continue. It will not stop. So it's all about embracing this change. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to Ericsson, we are the technology leader when it comes to 5G, when it comes to the network part. And the 5G network will actually be a prerequisite for this digital transformation to continue. Right. So of course, going forward, a big part of our business will be to make sure that the networks are supporting whatever use cases mm -hmm. that are being invented over the next number of years. I think it's important also to remember that especially for industries that maybe traditionally are more conservative. And I will not mention any industry, but there are a few industries that do not see the change coming or is not embracing the change. Right. And for us, it's going to be important to be, uh, take a role in actually explain what networks can do to help these industries to evolve, not only in becoming more efficient or meeting customer demands in a better way, but also to make sure that they have a sustainable approach, which is from a climate perspective, extremely, extremely important. Mm -hmm. So I think our opportunities going forward is not only to provide the best networks and make sure that these networks continue to evolve, is also to, to be a, a catalyst with a number of different industries to explore what are the new use cases. I think you said it all, but I mean, if you were to pinpoint, say, one reason why you want to invest in Korea, what would you say? I, you know, Korea is number one. It, it, it's, I'm, I'm coming back to uh, Bali Bali again. <laughs> uh, Korea wanted to be number one. Right. 
And we are a global company. We mm -hmm. are present in 180 countries. We mm -hmm. provide 5G technology today to, to 50 countries. What we make possible here in Korea is something that we can reuse and copy. Because if it's possible to do it here in Korea, it would be very useful in other markets around the world. Seriously, it's a leading, not only the leading technology, but the um, characteristics of Korean humankind is one of the reasons why it's a very attractive investment destination. Yes. OK. Now, Francis, I have a question for you. Um, what kind of business environment does Songdo Biocluster, in which Saitiba is located in, offer? What are they offering? And are there certain characteristics that makes it different from other sites in the Asian Pacific regions? Songdo is a hugely interesting um, area, in fact. Um, and what makes it unique, uh, to, to go to that part of your question, is I think mm -hmm. it co-locates and it houses some of the world's biggest infrastructure in the manufacturing of uh, biopharmaceuticals. Um, the current uh, output, I believe, is around 560,000 liters annually of biopharmaceutical product, which is bigger than most of the clusters we have in the US or in Switzerland, uh, and which are known uh, uh, manufacturing hubs for, um, for biotech. And so not only does it have that, uh, it also has a, a vibrant ecosystem of small startups. So a lot of innovation and R&D happening. You've got um, global material, raw material suppliers uh, being housed there, uh, including ourselves, uh, as well as uh, government bodies uh, to support uh, the growth of the industry. So in a relatively small geographical area, you've mm -hmm. got the whole ecosystem together. And I think that's where you see uh, collaboration happening, where you see innovation thrive. And, and that's what I think uh, Songdo makes, uh, what makes uh, Songdo unique and why we, uh, why we want to enhance our presence there. So Mark, if you could tell us Korea's characteristics as a foreign investment area, I mean, so how, do you, how would you describe Korea in terms of an investment destination? So let's start with the global players. Um, we all know Samsung and LG, Hyundai, Kia mm -hmm. for us, but also the hidden champions, the mid-size mm -hmm. companies. In order to be close to the customer, you need to be present here. That's number one. Then uh, what should not be forgotten is also the soft power Korea has mm -hmm. with the K-culture. Mm -hmm. And recently, I think that many of us uh, saw now Ojingo Game, which is running all around the world, even bringing down Netflix uh, servers and, and traffic up a lot. Um, and, and uh, then other natural uh, advantages the, the peninsula has, like, for example, being in the middle of, of Asia, mm -hmm. very close to many, many cities with more than 10 million inhabitants, uh, which makes the, the ways very short. Um, and, and that is one reason that we invested a lot here into this country, not only for the domestic market, but also for the, uh, for the export market. Um, and on top of that, we have an excellent footprint when it comes to um, investments here in, in Korea. This together with a well-known operational excellence. And uh, why is that the case? Because we see it in all the statistics that ICT is, is, one, is number one, um, or Korea is number one. And, and all the other aspects, an, an excellent skilled workforce, which, which can make this actually happen. And um, I would say that if Korea would work a bit mm -hmm. on easing their regulations, that would make uh, everything easier. So have a look to it. There are a thousand advantages and, and a very few improvements, I would call it. So with, it, with that, are there any uh, future investment plans in Korea? So we are a global company. So we are competing with other regions in the world as well in BSF. And I just said all the big advantages uh, Korea has to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, we are constantly looking into opportunities to invest in Korea, um, increase of capacities, but also new investments like new plants, fabrics. Um, not to forget that we are also uh, developing new technologies. Um, to name some now very interesting also in, in, uh, in the context of the Korean New Deal, mm -hmm. chemical recycling of plastics, a very urgent a uh, problem to solve here in Korea, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and here, definitely, Korea is a point to invest. Mm -hmm. um, I do my best, together with my colleagues, that we get the investments here. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, BSF will invest. And one recent example 
is that we will open our R&D center in Ansan, and uh, that's beginning of November. And there you see that we are that we are not only still one of the biggest foreign direct investors in this country. We want to keep that because for BSF it's important to be part of the fourth biggest chemical market in the world. Okay, so the investment opportunities that BASF seek in Korea is not only to benefit BASF, but also South Korea, and find the value in the rest of the world among a wider pool of human. It's what underpins a cross-border investment and commerce. So I'd like to thank all our guests who gave us many insights and share their experiences doing business in Korea. And we had a great discussion about South Korea as a promising place to invest in. Thank you. Innovation becomes a necessity in a time of crisis. And history tells us that by adapting, humankind can progress to a much better place. With COVID-19, we've witnessed firsthand how a wave of transformative change has swept across the world. While this is no easy feat, and organizations, corporations, governments, and nations have challenges to overcome, it's apparent now that innovation is no longer a luxury it has to form the core part of an economy's DNA. Culture of innovation, foundation for business resilience and economic recovery in the quote, next normal. Well, that's a wrap of the first portion of Invest Korea Week 2021 on innovative growth. But there's still more to come. Just ahead, the competitive advantages of doing business in South Korea. Key clusters for R&D and technologies, industrial complexes, special zones for regional development, and more. I'm back right after this break. <laughs>